If I were to tell you that in 20 minutes you would never have to worry about running a boring dungeon ever again, how would you feel? Well, what if I told you the only thing stopping you is a ballpoint pen and a white sheet of paper? Because if you truly want your players to enjoy themselves, then you will need to create what most dungeons lack a clear objective on a fuse with repercussions that actually matter. So today, I'm going to show you exactly how you can do this by giving you the 9 keys required to unlock the ultimate dungeon crawl. So if you're ready, then grab a pen and a blank piece of paper and write down your answers to each of these keys as we go along. So the first key is the most important key, I call it the master key. But unfortunately, most DMs skip this key entirely when building their dungeons. This key is so important that you can literally end this video after watching this first key, because everything you need to create a dungeon can be found inside the master key, which is backcasting. So let's sketch this out on your piece of paper with the little lines and arrows so you remember this forever. You'll see what I mean. Backcasting your dungeon can be done using four simple steps. But first, do you think you can answer the simple question that most DMs get wrong? What is the first thing you should plan when making a dungeon for your players? Is it the start, the middle, or the finish? If you answered the start, then you, my friend, are incorrect, because we always start with the end in mind. Sadly, many DMs miss this and create the most incredible dungeon crawls filled with traps and monsters for their players to encounter, only to realize an hour before session starts that they haven't had time to tie their dungeon together with a fabulous ending, causing them to slap together a few mid-tier, last-minute ending ideas, which leaves players feeling meh once they finish questing through their DM's many hours of hard work. The truth is, if your ending is not worth fighting for, then your players won't want to enter your dungeon at all. So the first step to mastering the master key is to plan your ending before anything else. The second step is to plan your start. This includes how your players find your dungeon, the entrance room, what encounters they may find, perhaps more social encounters than combat ones to start, such as a person asking for help. But let me give you a little word of advice to test the power of your storytelling skills during your next session. Send an NPC at the start of your dungeon to ask your players, Why are you here? If your players can't answer this simple question, then you probably need to improve your storytelling skills. But fear not, that's what this video is for. So after planning the start of your dungeon, you can safely move on to step 3 of my master key, which is to plan the journey in the middle. Many DMs fall into the deadly trap of having an incredible idea for a room inside their dungeon, so they build their dungeon around their special room, not realizing they created a mediocre dungeon for a single room buried deep within their dungeon that their players may never even choose to enter into. And we all know the feeling of putting our heart and soul into something our players never find. But this can all be avoided by using my master key. Because once you've planned all your rooms in between, you can proceed to step 4 which is to adjust on the fly. Perhaps the night is going late, and you opt to delete a room from your dungeon crawl. Well, that's perfectly fine, because your players will never know. I include more info on backcasting in my printable PDF book, Roll Me a Dungeon. But what if I told you not all endings are created equal? So the next key is, how do we create a goal that will enrapture our players' attention? There are six major goals for which your players will embark on a dungeon crawl. These six major goals are as follows. Loot, MacGuffins, Rescue Missions, Accidents, Vendettas, and Moving In. Let's briefly look at each one. First, for loot. Perhaps the goal of your dungeon is for your players to retrieve enough gold pieces to buy better gear for their next adventure. Boring for you as a DM, but this can be a big motivator for your players, so you don't want to sleep on this. Or perhaps your dungeon is known for its emeralds. Or it could be a magic item museum. I wrote a book with over 1,000 loot ideas you can give to your players as reward items sorted by location and ranked by value for easy reference. But why should we use MacGuffins, and how do they differ from loot? MacGuffins are items that really shouldn't benefit your players in the short term, but will help them achieve their goals in the long run. Bonus points if you make your MacGuffin awkward or cumbersome, so that your players question multiple times throughout the adventure whether it's worth it to keep their MacGuffin or throw it away. Perhaps your MacGuffin could be a really annoying talking cane with a superiority complex. Let your imagination run wild. 
for more MacGuffin ideas, I created a printable MacGuffin generator. You can find it on my website, or in my book, Roll Me a Dungeon. The third goal is a rescue mission. This goal sounds simple, but be careful or you'll fall into the same trap that I see countless DMs fall into, and that is to misvalue your NPCs. You may assign a high value to one of your player's parents, when in reality, they care way more about Boblin the Goblin who they adopted last week. So when kidnapping an NPC for your players to go save, be sure to kidnap NPCs your IRL players actually value in their hearts, and not just say they value on paper. To make your kidnapping more convincing, be sure to add a reason that makes sense. If you're struggling for a reason, two easy reasons for kidnapping you can always fall back on are slavery and human sacrifice. Fun fact, the purpose of human sacrifice is always to gain power from a higher entity by the shedding of blood, because your blood has value. The fourth goal you can use is to escape an accident. Perhaps one of your players is walking through a dense forest when the ground falls out beneath their feet, sinking them deep down into the catacombs of an ancient jungle temple. In this scenario, your players are here because someone failed their deck save, and now they have to quest their way out of this accident. The fifth goal you can use is the Vendetta. The Vendetta plays on a powerful emotion we've all felt before called bitterness. For example, maybe an evil syndicate killed your player's precious NPC, Boblin the Goblin, and now your players are out for revenge. Or perhaps a BBG screwed your players' progress earlier on in the campaign, and now your players want to settle the score. A powerful way to give your players a vendetta against your NPCs is to steal your players' hard-earned loot or magic items. Some of your players may go feral. The sixth goal, one you may see less of, is moving in. Perhaps one of your players received a large inheritance from their dying uncle that includes a sketchy castle on the outskirts of town. Turns out, that castle is, indeed, very haunted and requires a little spring cleaning and zombie slaying if your players want to move in and make a home base. There may be traps and security measures too that your player's late uncle forgot to deactivate. But while having a goal is crucial to your success, without this next key, your goals can be easily avoided by your players, making this next key something every DM needs to master before running a successful dungeon. This key includes one of my favorite techniques, but you don't have to limit yourself to only using this key in your dungeons, because this key can be applied to any questline or objective in your D&D world. The third key is setting high stakes that fit your campaign. The three types of steaks that your players will eat up faster than a nine-year-old boy can scarf down half a dozen chicken nuggets are comfort zones, ticking clocks, and reputation. But how can you use these scenarios in your D&D campaign? Let's start with comfort zones. Comfort zones play off your players' fears, flaws, and regrets by wrenching them outside of their comfort zones to either overcome their discomforts or die trying. For example, maybe your party's dragonborn is afraid of heights, so why not build a tall dungeon filled with tightropes suspended high above the ground? This may require delving into your players' backstories, but it feels so incredibly worth it as you watch your players shudder in their boots. Maybe the human PC lost their family in an orc raid, and now they hate orcs, but are forced to work together with an orc NPC in order to make it out of your dungeon alive. It's encounters such as these your players will always remember. Next, we have ticking clocks. Ticking clocks can make even your most passive players sit on the edge of their seats in suspense as they fear for their lives because ticking clocks play on your player's primal desire to survive. But this technique will only work if your players know that their clock is ticking. So how do you use this technique in a dungeon? Perhaps your players are questing through an underground labyrinth when all of a sudden, it starts to flood with water. With each room they enter, the water level increases, showing no signs of stopping past their knees, then their waists, now up to their chests, and soon their chins. Will they drown, or will they escape before time runs out? Or perhaps one of your players got infected by a rare magical virus and are in desperate need of a cure before they turn into a foul aberration not found in the monster's manual. Their skin has already started changing color as their limbs begin to take shape. It's only a matter of time before the infection runs its course, but they were told there was a cure at the end of this dungeon, so if only their party can reach the end of your dungeon in time. Now that you've got the basics, you can probably think of a lot more ticking clock ideas for your dungeon. 
Jot them down on your piece of paper and press play when you're ready to continue. If you want more ideas, I've written up over 30 ticking clock prompts you can use in my book, Roll Me a Dungeon. The third stake you can use to captivate your players is by using reputation. Perhaps one of your players is afraid of looking silly in front of the fair maiden they found attractive in your last session. Or maybe one of your players is on a mission to prove themselves to the father who never loved them as a child. Or perhaps another one of your players is constantly babied by their granny and wants to prove to dear granny that they can take care of themselves. You get the idea. Combining the stakes I share with you in this key will create irresistible reasons for your players to pursue the alluring goal you set for your dungeon. But beware, because while having a goal without stakes is like floating down a lazy river on a hot summer day, having stakes without a goal is like drifting aimlessly in space with no oxygen tank. So these two keys go hand in hand and should not be separated if you want your players to have a good time every time, which just so happens to be the reason I make you videos. The fourth key is sadly where most DMs start planning their dungeons, skipping the crucial first three keys, and that is your dungeon's location. What does the environment of your dungeon look like? Is it coastal or buried deep in a mountain's core? What does the building or structure look like? Is it built in a tower that scrapes the heavens? or on a giant ship that's slowly sinking. Here's a pro tip that most people miss about your dungeon's environment. Once you have defined your dungeon's location, jot down one benefit and one threat that your environment provides your players. Feel free to pause the video, pick an environment for your dungeon, and jot down one benefit and one threat for your environment now. If you want a tip that your players will love, consider adding a local critter in your dungeon environment. Imagine the look on your players' faces while they're slaying terrible monsters deep within your dungeon when they come across an abandoned room in your dungeon home to a stray cat or a family of wild foxes. These local critters may even become your party's new mascot, which you can leverage later on in your campaign against your players for a crazy questline. This next key will remain hidden from your players, but will make your dungeon experience a hundred times more believable if done right, which is your dungeon's lore. While you shouldn't waste your time on this key, skipping it altogether is a tragic mistake. Writing your dungeon's lore should be as simple as answering the following question. Why does your dungeon exist? Perhaps your dungeon was a military base of operations, or a nobleman's safe house. Whatever the reason, take a moment to jot down the reason your dungeon exists on your piece of paper. Feel free to press pause now and continue the video once you've finished. The sixth key every dungeon needs is a palpable ambience. Or is it ambiance? I can never tell. The purpose of this key is to create a solid atmosphere your players can taste. Because if you can make your players feel something, they will be far more likely to believe you. A mistake DMs commonly make when describing atmosphere and ambience in their campaign settings is to focus only on what their players can see. But what do your players smell when they enter your dungeon? What do they hear? What does the ground feel like beneath their boots? Are they crunching on bones, or are they softly plodding through thick layers of dust? Perhaps they're squelching on billions of maggots which infested your dungeon floor. Consider your player's five senses and ask yourself, how can I describe the rooms in my dungeon with more senses than sight? You don't need to use all five senses to describe each room your players walk into but using two, or at the very most three, should more than suffice. Sadly, many DMs fall into the trap of planning their entire dungeons around this next key, which, as I mentioned earlier, mixing up the keys will cause your players to lose interest in your hours of hard work real fast. The seventh key a dungeon should have are inhabitants. While it is possible to have a dungeon without any inhabitants, I'd advise against it, because creatures add life to your dungeon that will engage your players far more than any puzzle or trap. We've already talked about local critters in the fourth key, but now we're going to dive deep into the creatures who are actively involved in running your dungeon. These can include managers, guards, prisoners, slaves, lost wanderers, and the list goes on. But planning these creatures can be simple once you've learned how to use the hierarchy of inhabitants which I invented to make your life easier. Take a moment to sketch out a large triangle on your piece of paper. This is your power pyramid. The best place to start is from the top of your power pyramid. Here are five questions you can use to quickly fill your dungeon with creatures that make sense. If you're in a hurry, simply write the creature's race in the empty fields. But you can honestly get as detailed as you want with your answers. The five questions are 1. Who or what runs this dungeon? 2. Who or what attends to their needs? 3. Who or what defends this dungeon? 
list one to three different types of creatures here. 4. Who or what maintains this dungeon? List one or two different types of creatures here. 5. Who or what is imprisoned by this dungeon? This question is optional, but adds a layer of dimension to your dungeon that your players will appreciate. I'm going to take a moment to answer these questions for an imaginary dungeon just so we get an idea, and I'm going to input them into my power pyramid. Question 1. Who or what runs my dungeon? Answer. An Archmage. Question 2. Who or what attends to their needs? Answer. A Gauth with an attitude. Question 3. Who or what defends this dungeon? Answer. Spectators, Gifts, and Tamed Lucratas. Question 4. Who or what maintains this dungeon? Answer. Underpaid Grumpy Gnomes. Question 5. Who or what is imprisoned by this dungeon? Answer. A Mind Flayer. One thing DMs often overlook is that the prisoners in a dungeon don't have to be good. Maybe your dungeon has imprisoned an ancient evil monstrosity intent on destroying the known world, until your players march in and accidentally let it out. Techniques like these make for great cliffhangers at the end of your dungeon crawls. But what about the inhabitants that are not out to kill your players? The most requested segment when I was writing my book, Roll Me a Dungeon, was adoptable NPCs. Literally, any creature can be an adoptable NPC, even the big bad guy. I've seen it happen in my table. The key to running adoptable NPCs is to not force them on your players. Your players can tell when you are trying to shove someone or something onto their party, and will subconsciously resist your machinations. Instead of planning your adoptable NPCs, simply look for opportunities when your players are in the mood to create new friends, and be willing to work with them to change your story when they inevitably make your throwaway NPC their new best friend. The eighth key to running a dungeon your players will love is building meaningful dungeon rooms. Starting with the eighth key is a surefire way to make your dungeons feel robust yet pointless. Some questions that will help you get your creative juices flowing. Who are the creatures living in your rooms? What do they do in those rooms? What are three items you can list in your room? Does your room have any magical effects such as zero gravity, magical darkness, or perhaps your room has an anti-magic field? Are there locked doors, hidden doors, false doors, talking doors? Are there secret passageways, waterways, ventilation shafts that act as shortcuts? Are the vents safe or trapped? Which leads us to our ninth key for making better dungeons, the traps. If you made it to the final key, pat yourself on the back. You almost have everything you need to build a dungeon your players will truly appreciate from the bottom of their hearts. The traps you throw at your players are confined only to the limits of your imagination, so let's use this segment to jumpstart that imagination of yours. There are three types of traps we'll discuss today. Everyday traps, not traps, and mimics. Everyday traps include traps like pit traps, projectile traps, dirty traps, and magic traps. You can always borrow inspiration when planning traps from your favorite books, games, and movies, such as the rolling boulder trap from Indiana Jones. But first, Pit Traps. What is waiting at the bottom of your pit trap? Let's get creative. Some fun things you can use to injure, set back, or just plain old freak out your players include acid, bodies, an empty pit trap, lava, piranhas, a portal that leads to somewhere else, quicksand, snakes, spikes, or just plain old water. Sadly, we don't have time to cover all the other types of everyday traps in this video, but if you want more ideas, I've written plenty more in, you guessed it, my book, Roll Me a Dungeon. Next, we have the Knot Traps. This is a brilliant way to mess with your players. Let me give you an example. You place a pressure plate in your dungeon that does absolutely nothing. When your players enter the room, you mention this pressure plate to your players. Your players proceed with extreme caution, treating this pressure plate like the nuclear launch codes that will destroy the world as we know it, when you secretly know nothing is going to happen when it's pressed. The more suspicious your not trap looks, the more it will mess with your players' heads. But what if I told you the ultimate way to give your players trust issues is to use the final trap in our arsenal, the Mimics. If you want 100 ridiculous mimic ideas that your players will never see coming, click this video here. And don't forget, you're a legend. Subscribe if you're still watching, and I'll see you in the next video.